This video highlights the diagnosis of cochleofacial nerve dehiscence as well as the outcomes of round window reinforcement surgery. During this video, I will talk about the consequences of vestibular asymmetries. I will also focus discussion on third window syndrome, reviewing the phenotype, that is, what patients experience clinically with this disorder, as well as review the sites that are currently known for a CT positive third window syndrome. I will also discuss CT negative third window syndrome and finally present the case of a 12 year old young man with third window syndrome due to a cochleofacial nerve dehiscence. We will review the symptoms and recovery, the diagnostic findings, as well as objective validated survey instruments such as the dizziness handicap inventory and the headache impact test. Normally within the inner ear, each of the five receptors on one side are paired with a specific receptor on the opposite side. The reason for this is as we turn our head, tilt our head, are accelerated or decelerated, the firing rate will go up on one side and down on the other. Normally it's equal and opposite. However, if something changes on one side and it's not equal and opposite anymore, the brain will see this difference and interpret this as you're still moving. So if it's a rotational receptor asymmetry, patients will have the illusion of movement, which is a true rotational spinning vertigo. If it's the gravity receptors, patients will experience dizziness that can be characterized as a rocky, wavy, tilty sensation. Sometimes it feels like the floor falls out from under them. They're pushed, they're pulled, they're tilted or flipped. This can lead to activation of the autonomic nervous system. Experiencing nausea is common but patients can also experience cold, clammy skin, decreased heart rate, and even vomiting and more severe asymmetries. Particularly with otolithic asymmetries of the gravity receptors, the brain can be disrupted, producing cognitive dysfunction, spatial disorientation, and anxiety. One group of disorders that can cause these asymmetries is third window syndrome. This, in particular, creates a gravitational receptor asymmetry. These patients are very sensitive to loud sounds, and loud sounds can induce a tilting or rocking sensation, nausea, dizziness, pain, headache, falls, and spatial disorientation. They can also hear internal sounds unusually well, hearing their heartbeat or pulse, hearing their breathing, and a third of the patients can hear their eyes move or blink, chewing, a resonant echoey voice, and clinically, a low-pitched tuning fork applied to the extremities can also be heard within their head in most patients with third window syndrome. Third window syndrome can also produce cognitive dysfunction. Patients feel fuzzy, foggy, spacey, out of it, memory's poor, concentration is down. They can feel fatigued. They can also experience slurred speech, difficulty finding the right word or names. They can also feel ear pressure, which is due to an overaccumulation of fluid in the central compartment of the inner ear, or something known as endolymphatic high drops. These patients are also very sensitive to changes of barometric pressure. They can experience a hearing loss, which is measured as a pseudoconductive hearing loss. They can perceive tinnitus of the ear, and finally can experience migraine headaches, including the three variants of migraine, hemiplegic migraine, ocular migraine, and vestibular migraine. There are several known bony defects that can be seen with a high resolution temporal bone CT that produce third window syndrome. Most commonly is superior semicircular canal dehiscence, but also posterior semicircular canal dehiscence, lateral semicircular canal dehiscence, posterior canal jugular bulb partition dehiscence, a wide vestibular aqueduct, post-traumatic hypermobile stabes footplate, cochlear carotid partition dehiscence, cochlear internal auditory canal dehiscence, cochlear facial nerve dehiscence, and most recently, vestibule middle ear dehiscence. Third window syndrome can also be caused by defects of the inner ear that cannot be imaged with the current resolution of our temporal bone CT scans. One such site could be the medialis, the area where the nerves from the inner ear leave the cochlea and pass back toward the brainstem. 
An unrecognized cochlear facial nerve dehiscence is also a possibility, as is an unrecognized cochlear internal auditory canal dehiscence. Another entity which has not yet entered the literature is an unrecognized facial nerve lateral semicircular canal dehiscence, as described by Dr. Jerry Gianoli. Finally, perilymph fistula with a defect around the round window or oval window is another possibility. Let's talk about our case. At the time, he was a 12-year-old young man who had one well-documented concussion. This was a football injury, and he followed a concussion algorithm. He later returned to playing four weeks later without incident. Subsequently, he developed acute sinusitis with vigorous nose blowing. He had the acute onset of left-sided third window syndrome symptoms. These symptoms, which will be described in a moment, were also accompanied by constant nausea. He also had a history of migraine headaches. The onset of these headaches occurred during early childhood. There was also a strong family history of migraine headaches. However, these headaches became markedly worse when his third window syndrome symptoms developed. As measured by the headache impact test, his score was 62 preoperatively, placing him in the worst class, namely that of class 4. He also experienced ocular migraines, light sensitivity, and nausea. After his left round window reinforcement surgery, he experienced a marked improvement. At the time of his initial evaluation, he did have third window syndrome symptoms. Loud sounds would increase his headache, produce nausea, and also dizziness. His balance would worsen, and he had difficulty walking and standing. His dizziness handicap inventory score was 58, representing a severe handicap. He also experienced left-sided autophony. He had other activities that he noted would worsen his symptoms, including exertion and riding in elevators. He was experiencing cognitive dysfunction. Not only did his academic performance decline, but his family needed to withdraw him from school. His memory was impaired, as was his concentration. He had difficulty finding the right words and also experienced difficulty in reading. Many patients with third window syndrome will describe the words floating on a page and unable to come in. Third window syndrome is also a spectrum. Not all patients experience the symptoms that I described earlier. In fact, he did not experience spatial disorientation. He had no difficulty judging distances. He had no sense of detachment or feeling separated from other people. He had no perception of the walls or floors moving, and he had no out-of-body experiences. He also did not experience anxiety. Patients with third window syndrome, particularly the more severe gravitational receptor asymmetries, can have a sense of impending doom. His objective diagnostic studies included an audiogram. However, this did not show a pseudoconductive hearing loss, as is often seen with third window syndrome. His cervical vestibular evoked myogenic potential thresholds were reduced on the left down to 75 decibels. This was the ear with cochleofacial nerve dehiscence. On the right, his threshold was normal at 95 decibels. This was his normal ear without evidence of third window syndrome. His computerized dynamic posturography revealed that he had a vestibular deficit type of postural discontrol. He fell multiple times in sensory organization test 5 and 6 using an ankle dominant strategy. His composite equilibrium score was just below the limit of normal at 51. His center of gravity analysis revealed increased sway, which is typical of otolithic disorders. This figure illustrates the findings of his high resolution temporal bone CT. These are axial images which have been inverted. On the top panel, the right side and the left side show that the cochlea is colorized in blue, while the facial nerve is colorized in yellow. The image on the left side on the top represents the right ear, and the red line shows the bony partition separating the cochlea and facial nerve, which is normal. On the left, which is shown on the right side of your screen at the top, you can see there is no bony partition between the cochlea colorized in blue and the facial nerve colorized in yellow. Below these images are the native views that show 
On the right side of your screen, the facial nerve and cochlea are contiguous, whereas on the left side of your screen, representing the right ear, that black line represents the cochlea facial nerve partition. On 11 February 2015, he underwent a left round window reinforcement surgery to treat his left cochlea facial nerve dehiscence. In the next two videos, he describes his pre- and post-operative symptoms one day after his left round window reinforcement surgery. These videos were recorded on 12 February 2015. So back in September, I was in a football game and I got hit really hard on the side of the head on my left side. And I, um, I, I saw like flashing stars and everything just gory vision. So I um, got taken out of the football game and um, did the, my coaches did concussion protocol. And um, I sat out the rest of the game we went to the doctor, or after that, I felt fine for um, a couple days. And then when I went back to school on Monday, I just got really sick and started getting all, my, all these concussion symptoms. So we went to the doctor, and I got diagnosed with a mild concussion. And it um, actually made a hole in my lower ear. And um, I've had dizziness, nausea. I've thrown up a lot and um, headaches and just everything about everything, um, all the symptoms you have with a concussion. And um, so I, everything got better and I um, took four weeks off from football. I went back uh, to, with my team and played the rest of the season without any symptoms. We did good and we won the championship. And then um, we took a long break um, until basketball season started. And then when basketball season started, all my symptoms started coming back. And we kept going to each doctor, like my physician, um, and we're just specialists. No one could figure it out. And then um, we got referred to Dr. Wackham, or sorry, um, we got referred to, um, oh, we got referred to a specialist and um, he thought it was a hole in my ear and we also went to a neurologist and he they both agreed um that it was a hole in my ear so on February 11th I um went to the hospital and had surgery on my lower ear to um repair the hole and um put a laser on it and repair the um repair the hole and put foam in it and now um I'm feeling a lot better and um, it's all my pain is really suppressed and the doctors did a really good job. Next, he describes his post-operative symptoms seven months after his left round window reinforcement surgery. This video was recorded 10 November 2015. So I had a surgery seven months ago and uh, my symptoms before were um, headaches, dizziness, nausea, and vertigo. And um, and uh, after I had surgery, they started getting a lot better. And now I only have like migraines every two, uh, two times every month. And um, yeah, so. And did loud sounds bother you before the surgery? Yeah. What happened with that? Uh, when I heard like a loud sound, like like a stomp or something, I would just like like have to cover my ear and like close my eyes because it would like, start hurting really bad. Did it do anything besides hurting? Um, not, not really. No? Nothing to do with dizziness or nausea? Uh, actually, yeah. It, um, it made me, like, pretty dizzy, and it kind of, like, like, messed up my balance, too. Mm -hmm. How was your thinking? Uh, it was kind of clouded, and I, I could only concentrate on, like, how dizzy I was and how much it, like, it was hurting and I couldn't really concentrate on anything else. Anything change with school at all? Uh, I had a hard time focusing after I went back to school, but I still got good grades. Mm -hmm. And what about inside sounds? Um, I could hear my blood before, like my, my heart pumping and stuff, but yeah. now I can't. Okay. And then the headaches that you had, 
back before the surgery, what were those like? Like really intense and like every day. Um, I'd, I'd just have to like, like cover my eyes so there'd be no light anywhere because the light was really sensitive. And I just had to like go away in like a really dark room and couldn't like look at books or anything. Or and was it most of the time when you were awake or was it just it come on during the day or how what was it like? It was most of the times when I was awake, I think. Like I would take a nap and I would wake up and it would still hurt. And so you had a period of time without any migraines, but then they started back up again. How are the migraines different now? Uh, I think they're less severe and um, they're not as intense as they were before. They're, uh, I can control them easier with like Advil. And are loud sounds bothering you? No. Another way to measure the impact of the vestibular dysfunction and also the headaches before and after surgery is the use of the dizziness handicap inventory and also the headache impact test. The dizziness handicap inventory is a 25 item validated survey instrument that is used to quantify the self-perceived impact of dizziness on everyday life. This questionnaire was also designed to quantify the effects of treatment of vestibular system disease. The rationale for this instrument is that effective management should be reflected by an individual's ability to resume his or her pre-morbid vocational and recreational activities. The headache impact test is also a self-assessment inventory that includes six items in a validated survey instrument. After scoring, patients can be classified in one of four categories. Class 1, representing the best category, has a minimum score of 36, and Class 4, or the worst category, has a score greater than 60. His preoperative dizziness handicap inventory score was 58, representing a severe handicap. Postoperatively, the score fell to a value of 8. The headache impact test preoperatively had a score of 62, placing him in the worst category, namely that of class 4. Postoperatively, this value fell to 39, placing him in the best category, class 1. In this video, he describes his postoperative symptoms one year after his left round window reinforcement surgery. This video was recorded 25 February 2016. I had surgery about a year and two two weeks ago. Um, things have been going really good. I haven't had any ear pain for a really long time and that, no dizziness. Um, and I just feel like completely healed and really good. And um, yeah, I, I just feel really good and not a lot of like bad things are happening related to the ear. How's your thinking? Uh, it's good. Yeah, it's not clouded anymore. And what was it like when it was clouded? Uh, I couldn't focus and I couldn't write or read, couldn't go to school, and I just, I couldn't think straight. And were you ever, ever able to hear inside sounds? Uh, yeah, I could hear my blood rushing and my, uh, my heart pounding. And how about now? Nope. Three and a half years after his left round window reinforcement surgery, he is playing basketball, running, and participates in competitive lacrosse as a defenseman. These videos were recorded in August of 2018. Come on, Henry! Good job. Good job. Nobody. In conclusion, the sequelae of vestibular asymmetries and third window syndrome symptoms due to cochleofacial nerve dehiscence can resolve after round window reinforcement repair. Cognitive dysfunction is reversible 
the autophony is reversible, the nausea is reversible, and most importantly, the sound-induced dizziness or the gravitational receptor asymmetry type of vertigo is reversible. Finally, migraine headaches resolve or markedly improve to the degree that they can be managed medically.